presence of the Lord. Wow. He is just so good. And this is what we were created for. This. Uh, kind of, the Lord kind of demonstrated the end of the sermon for us already. So we can go ahead and get started at the beginning. Uh, last Wednesday, we did a scripture snack. And for today, God said, turn it into a scripture meal. So that's what we're going to do. Is this on? I turned off the piano, yes. So signs and wonders are going on over here. <laughs> He's giving signs, and I'm a wondering. <laughs> All right. So Wednesday, we talked about Proverbs 24:10, a very encouraging verse. It says, "If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small." Or as the message says it, "If you fall to pieces in a crisis, there wasn't much to you in the first place." Nobody wants to hear that their that their strength is small, especially after they fainted. Well, your strength was small. <laughs> there you go. Everyone wants to hear. Everyone wants to hear how such a good fighter you are, and you're a strong fighter, or at least that you put up a good fight. The word "faint" here means to slacken, to abate, to cease. So this isn't like getting the vapors and falling over, like you picture fainting to be, like something that just happens to us. This verb is something, almost something we decide to do. We decide to slacken. We decide to abate. We decide to cease. And here's another uplifting verse that uses the same Hebrew word for faint, although it's a different word in English. It's the same word in Hebrew. And that is Proverbs 18.9. It says, He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. So in the Hebrew language, the word slothful and the word faint are the same Hebrew word. So work there can mean occupation or just mean something you do. So today we're going to apply it as just something we do. And what are we called to do? One of my favorite verses, Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Yeah. Meditate on the Bible day and night. Do what the Bible says to do. Say what the Bible says. There's no room for slothfulness in this verse. Yeah. Day and night is not a chance to be slothful. There's no room to be slack. Look at the outcome for this, this diligence. You will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. Going back to the two verses of Proverbs, if we allow it to, adversity can lead us to destruction. If we are slack, or we cease, like the definitions for the words faint and slothful, if we are slack, or even to cease to think, to speak, and to do the word of God, why would we think we could stand against adversity should it come to us? If, if we're being slackful, if we're even ceasing and are speaking the word, thinking the word, and doing the word, why do we think we have a chance to stand against adversity? And the proverb about slothfulness says, we're a brother to destruction. Who wants to be a family member to destruction? Yeah. And we all know nobody can push your buttons faster than hard, and harder than a family member, right? They can hurt your feelings in zero to 60 <laughs> and zero seconds. I mean, it's just that fast. And you can't close your door to family because they know where you hide the key, right? <laughs> so the same is the true with adversity and destruction. If you become a family member to it, you're, your door's wide open to it. Yeah. If we're ceasing and thinking, saying and doing the word, then our door's wide open for destruction to come in. That's right. 
We don't want to be a family member to adversity and destruction. We want big strength, right? <laughs> okay. Good. I'm glad there was a resounding yes. <laughs> but like we talked about with Joshua 1.8, we need to meditate on the word day and night, which of course brings us to Romans 12, verse 2. It says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I like how the passion says it. It says, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you. The culture can talk loud. Stop listening. But be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total total reformation of how you think this will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life satisfying and perfect in his eyes so it says this will empower you to discern God's will ever wonder what God wants you to do in a situation ever came up against adversity and said what do I do God if we allow the Holy Spirit to inwardly transform us and the total reformation of how we think, we can discern God's will. Why? Because God's will and God's word are one and the same. We can know his will by learning his word. Yes. And when we read, when we study God's word, we know who God is. And when you get to know somebody, you begin to trust them, right? So when we know who we are in Christ and who God says we are, we can begin to trust him right. that his word is true. Knowing who we are in Christ is a huge key to victory over the devil. Yeah. Huge. Because what, what, look at the Israelites when they sent 12 spies to check out the land. It says spies, but it really was like, hey, go check out what I'm giving to you, said God. And the ten of them came back and said, we're grasshoppers in their sight. They didn't know who they were in God. And God said, go check out the land I am giving you. Yes. They didn't catch that part, apparently. They, they think they had to do it in their own strength. So they were like, we're grasshoppers in their eyes. We don't know who we are in God. We, we were totally oblivious that God said he's giving it to us. So look what happened to them. But the two who knew who they were, and God, the two who knew God had already said, I am giving you this land, they were the ones who got to enter it. They're the ones who had the victory over the people who were sitting in the land, on their land. So when we are, we know who we are, we are seated in Christ in heavenly places. Pastor Doug was just talking about the name of Jesus. God is far, far above the most high. There is no most or high. <laughs> He's the mostest of the high far above the devil and all his minions and he always leads us to victory we are healed we are whole all the promises of God we know well we should know these they're all found in the Bible and the Holy Spirit will lead us to those verses if we let him if we let him see Romans 12 2 it's our job to let the Holy Spirit do it Let's turn to John 16, 13, since we're talking about the Holy Spirit. I love the Holy Spirit. He, he's like my high five friend. Good job, Holy Spirit. <laughs> I don't know. That is the best way to explain him. He's my high five friend. <laughs> John 16, 13 says, however, this is Jesus talking, when he, the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will tell you things to come. Huh. It might come in the form of a prophecy, thus saith the Lord, this is going to happen to you. Maybe, sometimes. But the verse says, he will guide you into all truth. Most of the time, Holy Spirit guides us to specific verses, because what is the Bible? It's the word of truth, right? Guide us into specific verses that will prepare us for what's coming. Then, when adversity comes, we already got it deep inside of us, and Holy Spirit will bubble it up. Remember that verse? Remember that verse? Remember that verse? And we realize, hey, 
I'm prepared for this. I can handle this. Because we already let Holy Spirit lead us and prepare us for what's to come. On Wednesday night, we talked about, um, in our, the book we studied, it was referenced as David when he went and gathered the five smooth stones at the brook. The five smooth stones <laughs> were likened to revelation, the rhema word of God, the scripture verses that the Holy Spirit will give to us. And we are the bag. <laughs> that sounds bad. We're the, we're the sackcloth that the, it's put in. <laughs> Don't want to be an old bag. <laughs> we are the beautifully hand-hewn bag that the stones are put inside. <laughs> so the whole, it goes deep into our spirit. So when we need it, when the giant comes standing before us, the Holy Spirit will pull it back out. Remember, here's, use this stone against the enemy. Use this stone against the enemy. That's how awesome our Holy Spirit is. One more verse on the Holy Spirit, maybe. John 14, 26. Again, this is Jesus talking. But the helper, our high five guy, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Holy Spirit doesn't prepare us and just leave us hanging. Thank the Lord. Sometimes in the middle of adversity, things can get hectic and noise, just the noise. I mean, sometimes you're like, stop the noise, stop the merry-go-round. But it's, if we remain sensitive to the Holy Spirit, see, our battle isn't out here. Ours, our power comes from inside, the Holy Spirit that's within us. We stop and say, Holy Spirit, what's going on? We stop and listen. He will remind us of who we are in Christ. He will remind us of what he has prepared us to do. Again, if we haven't been obedient to think the word, say the word, and do the word. Yes. Second Corinthians 2 Corinthians 2.14a. We all know this one. Just the beginning part of the verse. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. In Christ. That means Christ already did the victory for us. Oh. We could take this verse to mean that when adversity comes, then God will lead us to triumph. Yeah, that'll work. But let's combine this verse with the Holy Spirit telling us the things to come. Then the always leads us in triumph is actually the preparing process. So when we think, oh, adversity comes, lead me to triumph, Lord, we're already a step behind. But if we, the adversity comes, I thank you, God, you already prepared me. You're already leading me into triumph when this adversity comes. I'm staying on the path because it's my triumph path. So we already are being led all the time. Again, if, if we don't slack, if we're not slothful and faint. That's how much God loves us, that he prepares us for what's to come. Deuteronomy talks about the blessings of God if we obey him, if we obey his word. And some of the blessings, the whole big old list of it, and we say it a lot of times on Sunday mornings. <clears throat> I mean, we say a big list of it. But the head and not the tail, we all heard that one, right? We are to be the head and not the tail. Well, the head knows what's going on before the tail does. The head is prepared for what's to come. The tail is subject to whatever's leading it. Yeah. The tail doesn't have the ability to prepare itself. It just goes along. So if we surrender to the Holy Spirit, we will be able to be prepared and know what's coming. If we don't, we're just tagging along to what life comes at us. Yeah. That's it. We're not prepared. We're not ready for anything. We're just, whoop, whoop, here I am in life. And then whatever comes at you, there it is. Yeah. All that's part of renewing our mind. Isn't that interesting how the Bible just intertwines itself? Yeah. And another reason for renewing our mind is so we can be in the habit of thinking on the word. Remember it said in Joshua 1, 8, day and night. And like Ephesians 4, 27, give no place to the devil. Why? Because the devil comes with thoughts of fear, thoughts of doubt, depression, whatever. He comes from the outside. And that's why we got our helmet of salvation. Salvation is more than, thank you, Jesus, I'm going to heaven. Salvation is our healing, our wholeness, everything we could ever need that's in our covenant with God. 
So we got our helmet of salvation saying, that's not in my salvation. I'm not taking that thought. That's not in my salvation. I'm not taking that thought. So when we fill our thoughts with the word of God, meditate day and night. Why? Because when the devil comes and you answer him with the word, you know, if you look back on when the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he came and he twisted the word. So another reason for knowing, having the Holy Spirit and knowing the word and meditating on the word is we know when the counterfeit comes. We know when the lies come. And the devil also comes with, what if? Did God really say? That was what he did to Adam and Eve. Did God really say? And he comes with, are you sure you're standing long enough? I think you might have missed it. I think you've been standing for too long against me. Well, he won't say against me. He'll just give you thoughts like, I think you've been standing too long against this adversary. I think, I think you missed it somewhere. So our job is to answer the devil with the word like Jesus did. Uh-uh, it is written. It is written. And then don't entertain his thoughts. Well, I wonder what the devil meant when he said that. See, that's where it gets going. So once we say it is written, we start praising and thanking God and filling our mouth with the thoughts of God and who God is and the word of God. So we give no place to the devil. That's one way we can get our great strength. We also need to speak the word like it says in Joshua 1.8. And that reminds me of Hebrews 10.23. It says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Yea, God. I like how the Amplified Classic says it. So let us seize and hold fast and retain without wavering the hope we cherish and confess and our acknowledgement of it. For he who promised is reliable, sure, and faithful to his word. Hold fast our confession. Now we're speaking it. We got it in here. We're putting it in here. And now we got to get it out of here. Without wavering. When we get the revelation that God is faithful to his word... We're able to stand as long as it takes, right? If you know your answer is coming, you're able to stand. I know my answer is coming. I know my answer is coming. Look at Jeremiah 1.12. Then, the then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. I use the King James because it says hasten. Hasten means to be alert, to be sleepless, to be on the lookout, to watch for so God's not sitting around in heaven going, did someone just say my word? Wait, what was that? Yeah. No, he's looking. He's on the lookout for us to say his word. He's up in heaven saying, say my word, say my word, say my word when a situation comes. He's got the Holy Spirit inside of us saying, say this word, say this word, say this word. But are we yielding to it? Right. He even has his angels on the lookout for his word. Yeah. Psalm 103 verse 20 says, bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Or as the Passion beautifully says it, so bless the Lord, all his messengers of power, for you are his mighty heroes who listen intently to the voice of his word to do it. God even has his angels listening for his word. He wants us to speak his word so they can fulfill it on our behalf. Amen. See, Jesus already died and healed for our sins and for our healing. It's already, we already are healed. And then the angels go and bring it to us. I need, I, need, I need a new something or other. And then you speak the word and the angels come and say, here's your new whatever you need. New tongue. You need a new tongue? There's your new tongue. Are your angels bored because they don't have anything to do because you never speak God's word? Are they standing around? Hey, what, what, give one angel to the other. Hey, what's your guy doing? Absolutely nothing. Look at him losing every area of life. <laughs> yep, mine too because they're not speaking the word. Or do your angels have whiplash? Psh, psh. Because just as fast as you speak the word, they go out, but then you speak doubt, so they stop. And then they take another step because you speak the word, then you speak doubt, and they stop. It's like that game. Did you ever play red light, green light when you were a kid? 
Some kids are super fast that you just don't even get a step in. Green light, red light, green light, red light. And they're stop, go, stop, go. Is that how your angels are? We don't want them to have whiplash. We want them to get the job done. Sometimes we think, God, why is it taking forever? It's because it's our mouth that gets in the way. I heard a story of a minister who needed thousands of dollars to buy the building they were in, and there was a deadline quickly approaching. And one day, two angels showed up in this man's room, and he wasn't surprised by him. I would have been like, oh, but he was like, hey, what you doing? <laughs> and uh, he asked them why they were there, and they told him, we're here to bring the money, to get your money for you that you need for this church building. And then they just stood there, and they just kind of looked at each other. And he's like, well, why aren't you going? And they said, we're waiting for your command. Speak the word. We're waiting for your command from you to go. So he gave them a scripture and said, go get the money, and they left. And then days later, that minister received the money. They're waiting to hear the word spoken. That's why it's important to keep the word of God in our mouth so we won't faint in the day of adversity. Romans 10, 8. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now those scripture verses go on to talk about salvation. But then again, we just said salvation is more than asking Jesus to be the Lord of our life. And it's more than just getting into heaven. It's the total freedom, the total victory, the total healing, wholeness, prosperity, peace, joy, everything that pertains to life and godliness through Jesus. We have to speak out what we want to receive. Someone can buy you a new car, and they can give you the title, and they say, your car's over at the dealership. Take your title and go get it. So you go to the dealership, and you can tell everybody, look, I got a title. Someone bought me a car. I got the title right here. And you go to the dealership, and you say, that's my car over there. But unless you go to someone who works there and tell them, go get my car, here's my title, you're just going to be standing there looking at your car. You won't do any good. You need to tell somebody who works there. Show them your title and tell them, go get my car and bring it over. Give me the keys. Fill it up. <laughs> our Bible is our title to everything we need. We can go around showing everybody, I got the title, I got the title. But if we don't say, according to my title, go bring it to me, what good is it going to do us? Everything we need is still out there. We won't get anything. We need to speak the word. To have great strength, we need to be doers of the word. Ephesians 6, I just wrote the whole thing, 10 through 14a. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, mm. In the heavenly places, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And then the next verse, stand therefore. If we want to stand against the devil, then we need to do the word and put on the armor of God, the whole armor of God. We need to do the word and be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, as it said in verse 10. That word strong there is to empower, enable, to strengthen. And the word power is dominion. And might is his force and his ability. So we could say the Lord empowers us with his dominion that he gives to us. He already gave it to us. That's why Jesus died. Because Adam and Eve gave the dominion to the devil. And then Jesus died and rose again, so he took the dominion back and gave it to us. God knows we have the dominion. The devil knows we have dominion. But do we know we have dominion? That's what the devil pushes us the hardest on. Do you really think you have dominion? Do you really think you have authority over me? That's what he pushes us the hardest on. 
He is a liar. We need to stand on the word of God, which says we have the dominion. And we continue to stand until the victory manifests. Continue to stand. Stand there for until it's done. The devil will try to use tactics to get us to doubt and faint, like we talked about earlier. Did God really say? If you were so spiritual, you would have had your victory by now. Something must be wrong with you. Something must be wrong with your approach. Maybe you've got to stand on one foot and do this while you, you know, say the word. God's not going to answer you. Do you know what you did when you were 12? God's not going to answer you. See, he tries to wear us out. He tries to wear out our strength. He is the accuser of the brethren. He is a liar. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's why we don't listen to him. That's why we answer with the word. Yes, I know what I did when I'm 12, but you know what? That's under the blood, so that's forgotten. It's been forgiven and forgotten, so we're done with it. Amen. And then we think, praise the Lord, you washed me clean. Thank you, Lord, you're my victory. Go on praising God. Amen. Something must be wrong with your approach. Well, I'm doing what the word says. I'm speaking the word. I'm letting the Holy Spirit tell me which words to speak, because you can speak any old word. Like they talked about Wednesday night, there's a couple kids who went to some camp where you had to memorize scripture verse and to go through an obstacle course. And each obstacle you face, you're supposed to say a different verse. Well, they were too cool for school, and they knew that the, you know, nobody said to the next obstacle what verse was already quoted, so they just memorized one verse for the whole week and used that whole verse through the whole obstacle course. That's not going to help you in real life. You can't just learn one verse and expect to be victorious through your whole life. It's called bullets. It's stones. It's our stone. We talked about it. It's our stones. You've got to have the right stone for the right giant. So the devil will try to wear out our strength. Again, Proverbs 24.10. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. That word again, strength is to be firm, vigor, force, in a good or bad sense. And you know what? Sometimes our strength gets tired. Because we've been standing a long time. Sometimes it just seems like a long time. But God is good and faithful. Sometimes, if we look at David and Goliath, and Goliath was just every day, you know, taunting the army of Israel. And then when David came out there, he was taunting David. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to give your body to the birds and the, be the beasts. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Just taunting, taunting. And sometimes it just gets tiring because we're human. We have flesh. Yeah. But God is good and faithful. And that word strength, we talked about this on Wednesday, is found in Isaiah 40, verse 31. I always think of Tina with this verse. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Yeah. And as the Passion says, because the Passion uses what the word for wait is in the Hebrew, it's those who entwine their hearts on the Lord. We entwine our hearts with the Lord. We, we get knitted together. We are one with God. That word faint there is to, to be tired, to be wearisome. And so we need to entwine our hearts with God, spend time with him in his word and in his presence. That is where our strength is renewed. That was praise and worship this morning. That's what that whole thing was about, the winds of refreshing. That's the renewing. We can only be victorious when we are entwined with the Lord. Why? Because we're not on our own. It's the Lord's strength that renews our strength. We know we are not alone when the adversity comes. The Hebrew word, listen to this, for faint there in Proverbs 24.10, if you faint in the day of adversity, that Hebrew word can also be fail in English. Deuteronomy 31.8, and the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you, or King James says, He will not fail you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. So God's not going to faint on us. God's not going to cease 
God's not going to, going to uh, be slack with us. That's what it says here. He will not fail us. That word, he's not going to do that to us. So we do not have to be fearful. We do not have to be dismayed. He goes before us. What is that? He prepares us. And he is with us through the whole thing. The Amplified Classic says, It is the Lord who goes before you. He will march with you. He will not fail you or let you go or forsake you. Let there be no cowardice or flinching, but fear not. Neither become broken in spirit, depressed, dismayed, and unnerved with alarm. God's promises, he's not going to fail us or faint on us. When we know who God is, we can trust him. When we trust him, we are able to stand in adversity knowing that he is leading us in triumph. To stand in strength, we need to think the word, speak the word, and do the word. We need to entwine our hearts with him in his word and in his presence so our strength can be renewed. And it's all because he loves us. Romans 8, 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Through him we're more than conquerors. Amen. And you know, we even talked about this Wednesday night. Sometimes being loved means we need to be corrected. Yeah. See, a lot of times people get the wrong idea of God that he's going to strike us down with lightning. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it just needs to be a change our way of thinking change our way of speaking, change our way of doing. That's bringing correction. God, this isn't working. We'll say this. That's correction. Did lightning strike you? No. Sometimes, sometimes we're thinking, God, I need help with my finances. And he might say, make a budget and stop spending foolishly. Did lightning strike? No. God, I need help with my health. Stop eating a box of ding-dongs and drinking a two liter of Coke every morning for breakfast. That's correction. He loves us. He will tell us what we need to do. That last one might have been a lightning. Oh, God, I have to give him my ding-dongs and my Coke. But no, he loves us. He will tell us to change our thinking, our speaking, and our doing because he prepares us into, and leads us into all victory. Amen? Amen? This can go, I mean, there were so many different verses you could go for that whole subject, <laughs> but that's the way the Lord led us. So those of you online, thank you for joining us, and I encourage you, get in the Word. Get your mind filled with the thoughts of God. Get your spirit filled with the verses and the revelation of God so you may stand and get to know God because when you know He is faithful, to his word, that he will do his word, you can stand until it's promised, until it's fulfilled. So thank you for joining us. Have a good and blessed week.